for centuries. Societies have been influenced and even defined by their empires. Throughout history, we've seen great empires and powerful emperors determined to alter the course of humanity. We still see the remnants of some of these kingdoms today. The Egyptians and their towering pyramids. China and its Great Wall. The royal roads of Persia and, of course, Rome. The empire of all empires. Kings and kingdoms of the world have attempted to define what it means to be human by using law and philosophy, religion and technology. But time has shown how all these kingdoms rise and then fall, descending into chaos. Why? Because their underpinnings of power and propaganda can only prop up kings and kingdoms for so long. Against this backdrop, stands one king, different from every other. He would speak of a kingdom that was entirely different, subversive to every worldly kingdom. He is unlike any other king, and his kingdom is unlike any other kingdom. Who is this king? His family called him Jesus. His followers called him Lord. He also goes by Rabbi, and Redeemer, Savior and Friend, Teacher and Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Son of God. He is the King of Kings. He healed the sick, touched the untouchables, embraced outcasts, breaking down all barriers. That's why His kingdom was a threat to those in power. And that's why he was arrested and sentenced to death on a cross. He who knew no sin became sin, our sin. He took up his cross and he bore it for all of humankind. He died for you and for me, for all our sins, past, present, future. And then he sealed that promise by rising from the grave after three days. That's why they say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Hey!
Jesus Christ is alive. We believe it today. We celebrate the story that he's given us. Come on, sing. But I saw Satan fall like lightning. Yeah. And I saw darkness run for cover. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Yes, it is. Now, come on. I believe in signs and wonders But I have a resurrection power Yes, I do it Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Come on, tell it My praise belongs to you forever Let's share our story This is my testimony from death to life Grace rewrote my story. I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. With blood and washed in water That's you and me Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started He always does Our God will finish what He started sound fantastic. Thank you so much for singing. You can be seated. Well, welcome to CCV. Happy Easter. How's everybody doing today? I want to I wanna welcome you. My name is Travis Brown. I'm the campus pastor here in Peoria. And whether you're joining us physically here on campus or you're joining us online, what an incredible weekend for you to be here as we celebrate. You know, every single week here at CCV, we do something as part of our service that Jesus himself gave for us to do when, whenever we gather together so that we can constantly be reminded of the sacrifice that he made. And that thing that we do is we take communion together. And hopefully when you walked into our uh, auditorium today, you grabbed one of these communion cups. In fact, you, you can get, one, get this out right now if you grabbed them. If you didn't get one, they're in the back of the room. If you wanna go grab one, help yourself. But as you take this cup out, we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna take communion together. 
On one side of this cup is a, is a small piece of bread, and if you peel the top back and take out that bread, we're, we're reminded every single week, this bread reminds us of Jesus' body that was beaten and hung on a cross for every single one of us. Let's take this bread together right now. On the other side of that cup is, is some juice. And as you peel the top back of that juice, this, this juice reminds us of Jesus' blood that he poured out while hanging on that cross so all of our sins would be paid for and so that we could experience forgiveness. Let's take this juice together. You know, as we continue to worship, we're reminded that it's only through his sacrifice and only by his wounds that we can experience healing. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, and what better weekend for us to be reminded of that than a weekend where we not only remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, but we also celebrate how he conquered death three days later. Let's pray together. Father God, during this time, we, we remember what you did for every single one of us. It's only through your sacrifice that we're able to experience hope and forgiveness and life. Thank you for sending Jesus for us so that, so that we have a way back to you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering. Home, but empty. How can there's a God who weeps, there's a God who believes, so oh, praise the one who would reach for me, and hallelujah to the Son of Son. Down in merciful pursuit to the sinner, your grace and the broken in grace, and in the end, the proof is in your wounds. Yeah. In the end, the proof was in your wounds. Come on, we sing. Okay. 
There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What is this kingdom Jesus spoke of? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. When kingdoms of this world yield power for position, Jesus uses power for the powerless. When kingdoms of this world use violence for control, Jesus liberates with nonviolence. When kingdoms of this world use propaganda, Jesus simply speaks truth. The kingdom of God is about peace and service. The kingdom of God is about reckless generosity. The kingdom of God is about radical justice. It's about acceptance and grace. It's about dying to yourself in order to live. It's revolutionary, overturning oppression by loving our enemies. And this kingdom is for everyone. Have you ever heard of such a kingdom? If it's not of this world, then where is it? This kingdom is within you. It's within me, not in a distant place, but a present reality. The kingdom of God is right here. It is right now. Here and now, your kingdom lives. Here and now, in our midst. Here and now, your kingdom lives. Here and now, here and now. Focus, give us focus. So all of our attention is on you.
I was born and raised in a really good Midwestern home. And I think I just fell into a lot of the traps that society says makes us happy. So one of those things that I was pursuing that I thought was a really healthy thing was, you know, fitness and nutrition and it became my passion and I, I just really fell in love with it. But then I realized that it turned into my identity. I was never fit enough. I was never pretty enough. Um, I never had the perfect body. I could never eat clean enough. It was just this constant striving that I, and I didn't understand why every day it just felt like I was burnt out and exhausted. So I didn't think there was another way. I thought, you know, if this is how I want to pursue health and be healthy, like this is just how it is. My father was a church pastor during the time I was in junior high and high school. Uh, I fell in love with chemistry. And as I immersed myself in science, I bought into the idea that sci what science is about is studying the universe, studying nature without the need for God. What I think caused me to, to leave my faith behind was the idea of doing it on my own, having others recognize what I was doing for me uh, and I think the pride of a young person trying to make it in the, in the uh, scientific world was what caused me to call myself an agnostic. I grew up in a broken home. Uh, I didn't have parents around. Uh, started uh, uh, getting into crime and, uh, at a very young age. I was arrested 37 times as a juvenile. Started using drugs heavy and uh, started robbing drug dealers. After 26 years of using drugs, I, I, I was at very miserable and lost, and uh, I, I didn't even want to live anymore. I was just lost and broken. Uh, I never knew anything about God. I always said I was God. I uh, never knew anything about Jesus, never touched a Bible in my life. I used to punch people in their eye uh, if they tried to talk to me about God. Being as I thought I was God, uh, I wanted to control everything in my life. I just decided I wanted to be the, the best of the worst. The barrier that was holding me back from giving my life to Christ was giving up this identity that I found in the world and what other people were telling me I was. My barrier to continuing as a Christian after being raised in the church was my desire to be known for accomplishments in science, which is really prideful. The barrier that kept me from giving my life to Christ was me. I just wonder if there's anyone here today and there, there's a barrier you have that's separating you from God. My name's Ashley and if you're new to CCV, I'm just so just honored that you would be here. I hope you feel right at home. I hope you'll come back. But my experience as a pastor has been that there's one big barrier that has a tendency to to separate people from God almost more than anything else, and here's how I describe it. People have a wrong picture in their mind of who God is. The great theologian A.W. Tozer once said this, he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I really think that's true, and here's why if you think about it, um, what you think of when you think about God will determine how much you trust God and how much you trust God will determine if you ever give your life to God, and that will impact your life not only on this earth, but for eternity. What comes to your mind when you think about God? I mean, we, we, we have to admit that pictures matter, right? I mean, it's been said a, a picture is worth a thousand words. That is absolutely true, and I can prove it. Let's just pretend you're, you're dating and single here today. I know not all of you are, but just pretend you're single and you wanna date, and you have a friend that comes to you and says, I found the perfect person for you. They're amazing, you have to meet them. What's the first thing you want? A picture, show me a picture first. Now if they showed you a picture, and it's someone, let's just be honest, um, looks like they haven't showered for four months, you know, looks like they're, they're just repulsive to you, what, what are you doing? You're out, no way. Now if they showed you a picture and you're going like, Well, that changes everything, doesn't it? 
because pictures matter. Now this Easter, I wanna ask, how confident are you that you have the exact right picture of God in your mind? No matter who you are today or what you walked in with, even if you walked in with two feet on the brakes when it comes to faith, I'm just glad you're here because Easter is the perfect picture of who God is. It really is, that God sent his only son to this earth. He loved you that much, that he sent his only son to die for you, to offer you to forgive all your sins and give you the hope of eternity because of the resurrection of Jesus. He conquered death. I mean, that's the picture of Easter. And when you understand who Jesus is, you'll see perfectly who God is. Watch how Colossians chapter one, verse 15 puts it. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, Jesus is the perfect picture of who God is. Now, if that's true, why is it that many of us, that's not the picture we have in our mind when we think about God? For a lot of us, it's, it's just because we bought into a lie that culture has told us. Can we be honest about that? For some of us, the reason we've not developed a correct picture of God is even more sad to me. And, and I just wanna keep it real today. The reason is because you've been given a picture of God by another Christian. And it's the wrong picture. I mean, can we just admit today some Christians can be kooky? Like kooky on steroids. And you may have grown up even in a church environment where the image they gave you of God is so wrong. That breaks my heart as a pastor. But for some of us here today, the image we have, the reason it's wrong, we developed it ourselves. You know, maybe because of pain or some sort of trauma or some sort of hard experience we went through, we began to project onto God an image that is not correct of who he is. I'll be transparent today. I think I've done that at times in my life, even as a pastor. I mean, there's times I've, I've had a day or a week or a season where things were not going well and I just begin to project onto God some things that just aren't true. Can I give you an example of a day like that? It was the summer of 2012. My wife, Jamie, and I decided to take our three girls camping. Why? I don't even know. I mean, it's our her family invited us and, and I did not wanna go, okay? I mean, taking three girls camping at the Grand Canyon in a tent sounded about as much fun as a root canal to me, honestly. So, but I was gonna play along, and so Jamie picked me up from work. We were always late, we were already late. There are, our whole family's already up there, so Jamie picked me up and said, let, let me drive, and we'll, we'll change off in Flagstaff, then you can drive. I said, okay, cool, and so we took off, and we're on I-17, had, headed up to Flagstaff. We're 10 minute, or about 10 miles away from Flagstaff, and that's when it happened. We blew a tire. Um, on I-17, one of the most dangerous freeways in the world, highways in the world, and, and we were going about 80 miles an hour, and the van immediately started to lose control, I could feel it, and, and right as I'm leaning over to tell my wife, Jamie, let your foot off the brake, out of reaction, she just kind of put, hit the brake harder, and we spun out of control. Our van went into a 360 once across the freeway, spun again, and we're flying into the median of I-17 at such force, I knew we were gonna flip because we were going in sideways. And somehow by the grace of God, we slid sideways all the way across the median of I-17 to the other side almost into incoming traffic. I got out of the car and I, I thought, how do we not flip? And I realized how. It had rained really hard the day before and that median was full of mud and with the mud, we just slid all the way over. We had tire tracks in the mud about a, a, a foot deep all the way across. We, we slid at such force, our wheels came off the rims. That's how hard we slid in. I looked at Jamie and I said, you still wanna go camping? <laughs> you know what we did? We got towed to Sam's Club, put four new tires on our beat up van, and four hours later, we're still going camping. <laughs> what is going on? So we're going, now I'm driving now, we're on this little, two-lane road um, about 45 miles outside of Flagstaff, cranking, I'm driving, I'm probably going a little too fast because we're late, and all I remember, it happened, all I remember is there's on the road, pitch dark, middle of nowhere, bright light, bright eyes, and bam, I just 
I just destroyed some animal. I don't even see him coming. I pull over, the whole front end of the van is destroyed. <laughs> Everywhere. Now I'm like, what did I hit? I had no idea. I'm looking around. I found out later on I hit a giant cat. Okay, I hit a giant. <laughs> I'm kidding, I didn't hit a cat. <laughs> Settle down. I would even feel bad, okay? I would even feel bad if I hit a cat, all right, for you cat lovers. You know what I hit? I found out later on, you know what I hit? I hit a llama. I really, I hit a llama. The police officer told me, you hit a llama. And for, for like weeks afterwards, all my friends called me a llama killer. You know, it's like, they actually send me books. They sent me this book, you know. <laughs> yeah, Mama Mrs. Llama, because you killed her. Now, <laughs> We can laugh about it now, but I promise you, on the side of the road, stranded, I got towed again twice in one day. I remember being on the side of the road just going like, God, why are you out to get me? I remember God just whispering to my heart, I'm not out to get you to save you. That's the message of Easter, that no matter who you are, no matter what you walked in with, God came to save you. And for some of us, we need to tear up the bad pictures that we've developed in our mind about God. And I wanna help you do that today. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you four pictures of God. Three of them are the wrong pictures, and maybe you'll relate with one of these. One of them is the right picture, and here's my prayer. My prayer has been all week long that thousands of people across all of our campuses who've held off giving their lives to Jesus because of a wrong image, today's the perfect day to take a step of faith, even the step of faith to get baptized and give your life to Jesus. If you wanna take notes today, the very first image I think many of us have when we think about God is we think of a huge wall, just a huge wall. I mean, a, 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 a wall that is so big that there's no way you could get beyond it. And it's so big that you're on one side and God's on the other side and it's so insurmountable, God just seems so distant to you. And some of you feel that, it's like he's so far away. And that could be because of your doubts. By the way, God's not afraid of your doubts. It could be because of your sin. It could be because you just don't think God cares about you. And if that's your picture, I just wanna tell you today, it's, it's a wrong picture of God. I wanna tell you that in love because here's how I know. When, when God created Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve sinned and they ran from God, they tried to keep, create space between them and God. That's what sin does. What did God do? He ran after them. When you feel like there's space between you and God, you need to know that God will jump over any wall and bust through any barrier to get to you. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Acts 17, 27 says this, he doesn't play hide and seek with us, he's not remote, he's what? He's near. We live and move in him. You can't get away from him. And some of you that been, have been running from God for so long, God's been running after you. That's why you're here. I mean, think about it this way. When Jesus hung on a cross and he died for you, what is the very first thing that happened the moment Jesus died? Do you remember? Can I read it to you? Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. But Jesus, again, crying out loudly, he breathed his last breath. What happened next? At that moment, the temple curtain was ripped in two, top to bottom. That's the first thing that happened. What was the temple curtain? It was a massive barrier that existed in the temple that separated sinful man from a holy God. And no one could enter in God's presence. This curtain just cut everyone off. Only the high priest once a year could even enter or get close. And what happened? The moment Jesus died, that God tore that curtain in half to prove to you nothing can separate you from the love of God if you'd accept this free gift.
And we know it came from God because the curtain ripped where? Not from bottom to top, from top to bottom. God did it. So hear this today. God will break through or jump over any wall to get to you. And if you feel there's a wall, don't worry. God's right there. You know, the second um, image I think that maybe picture comes to mind for some of us is, is God is an accountant. <laughs> now hang with me. What many of us believe is that God's up in heaven and, and, you know, good people go to heaven. So God's counting up all our good deeds against all our bad deeds. And as long as we're a good person, like, we're, we're good, right? We go, good people go to heaven. The problem with this view is imagine, how would you ever know? I mean, and what is good? Because all of us sin, I do. I sin every single day as a pastor. There's something. How would you know? I mean, is it 51%? Is that what gets you in? Is it 60%? Is it 90%? Let's just pretend it's, 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 you just need to get over 50% and God's like, you're in. And you're like right on the borderline most of your life. The very last day of your life is a doozy. I mean, you yell at your wife, you blow up at your kids, you intentionally hit a llama on the freeway. You, know? <laughs> you get to heaven and God looks at you and goes, Ugh, sucks to be you, sorry. Pulls the lever, king, you know. <laughs> I, I want you to think about this view for just a moment. If good people go to heaven, why would God have ever had to send his son Jesus to die for you. You wouldn't need him, you could earn it on your own. That idea, by the way, makes a mockery of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, it does. And scripture says, that's not even close to how it works. Someone needs to hear this today. Good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do. There is no one that's good. Can you, can you see this from scripture? Romans 3, 23 says this, for everyone, that's me, that's you, we've sinned, we all fall shot, short of God's glorious standard. There's a standard that God has, it's perfection, and none of us meet the standard. Fair? God is perfect in heaven, which means only perfect people go to heaven, which disqualifies all of us, me included. You're like, then what would we do? <laughs> Very next verse. Yet God, is that not amazing? But God, in his grace, that's unmerited favor, he freely, remember that word freely, makes us right in his sight. How do you do it? He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. It's all about Jesus. He frees us. When Jesus died on the cross, God took the penalty of our sin and put it on Jesus. And now when Jesus looks at us, if you have Jesus in your life, he sees you as sinless because Jesus has forgiven you. It goes on to say this, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God, how? By their good works, wrong. When they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood, that is the only way to be made right in God's sight. Can I speak to someone here today? Your parents, for whatever reason, probably not out of their own fault, you just felt like you're, you had to earn their love. And they just maybe projected that on you, like you had to get the grades, or if you weren't performing on a sports field, you felt like their love was withheld from you. So you've been trying to earn it your whole life. And because of that, you've projected that same image onto God, and you've been trying to earn his love. And I just am here to tell you today, you can't earn it. He loves you right now for who you are. Regardless of your performance, you can never be good enough. Now for some of us, it's hard to picture God loving us unconditionally, and here's why. Because of, of a third really, really bad picture. And th this picture, by the way, has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with us. Because when you think about God, all you can see, you'd say, is my mess. It's like a huge pile of garbage that's just boiled up in your life from all the sin and all the junk and all the messes you've created and you know it and that's all you can see and so you think to yourself, God could never love me, I could never approach God because look at my life, it's a, it's a mess. And then you think this, well, well maybe I'll clean my life up first and then maybe God would give me a chance. And man, if I could, 
If I could smash one picture of God, it would be this one. I think this, this picture breaks God's heart more than any other picture because it's a lie from Satan himself. Do you know Satan's great job in your life is to, is to shame you, to keep you away from God? And you need to know, in Scripture, do you know who Jesus hung out with? He hung out, he hung out with people that had all the messes. And if Jesus was here today, if you feel like your life is messy, he would want to be with you. Because he'd want you to know he loves you and he came to save you. In fact, <laughs> Mark 2, 17, Jesus is hanging out with a lot of messy people. Watch what he says. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And if you feel like your mess keeps you away from God, just understand, it does not. God's waiting to help you with your mess. And you don't clean your life up first before you turn your life over to Jesus. Do you understand how backwards that is in thinking? You'll never clean it up on your own. You invite God into your life and he helps you clean up your life. That's how it works. And some of you, your just mess has kept you away. And I just wanna tell you, don't let your messes keep you from Jesus. Those are three bad pictures of God. What's, what's the right picture? Here's the picture I want you to have in your, in your mind today. And uh, I, I have a prop just to show you what it, what it looks like. It's a free gift. The right image of God is to understand the free gift of Jesus that God wants to give you. Watch how clear this is in scripture because we think so many times if it's a free gift and I don't have to do anything, there's gotta be a catch. No, watch this. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the, say it out loud, say it out loud. Free gift. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter two says this, for it is by grace Grace is unmerited favor. You can never do anything to deserve it or earn it. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a, say it out loud again. It's a gift. It's a gift. Why? Not by works so that no one can boast. Do you understand if you could earn your way to God? Do you understand you'd walk around boasting about it and putting everybody else down around you who isn't as good as you? And is that not a picture of Christianity in America today. We need to remember, especially this weekend on Easter, truly what the free gift of Jesus is that he wants to give you today. Do you know this is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world? Every other religion, you study it yourself, is really spelled do. You have to earn your way to God. And Christianity is completely opposite. It's God saying it's already done. God made his way to you and he's already paid the price for you to be forgiven. He just needs you to accept the free gift. Now, I invited my daughter here today. This is my youngest daughter, Ava, and I invited her to help me just, just illustrate this because God is, is our father and he loves you unconditionally as a perfect father would. Now, I love my daughter, Ava, beyond what you could ever imagine God loves you more. Imagine that I had the greatest gift I could ever give this precious girl. And I was like, Ava, please, this gift, you have to have it. Like, please accept it. And, and she, it was a little hard, you know? <laughs> but I just, do you understand when someone gives you a free gift, you still have to accept it? If I said, Ava, please, like, take it, take it, take it. This gift, it's gonna save you. You have to, we're separated. Like, there's no other way. You have to, you have to take the gift. Why? Do you understand how heartbroken as a dad I would be if she wouldn't take this gift? Do you understand the greatest gift you can give God and you can give yourself is to accept this gift? Give her a hand for helping me out. <laughs> Do 
that's the picture. God's like going like this to you. And you keep chucking it back in his face, giving him all the excuses. No, I got my doubts. God can't handle your doubts as long as you believe in his son Jesus and his resurrection. No, I got my messes. It doesn't matter your mess. God's gift is free. How do you receive the gift? Remember, you have to receive it. It's as easy as A, B, C. You still have to do something to receive the gift, by the way. It's free, but just like I could say, hey, I, I just gave you a million dollars, but you gotta go pick it up. You still gotta go pick it up, right? It's still free. Here's what you have to do, A, B, C. Admit you have a problem, that's sin, that separated you from God. You better admit that. You have to believe Jesus is the answer and commit your life to Jesus by repenting and being baptized. That's how you receive the free gift. Now let me walk through each of these. It has to start with A. If you won't admit your need for a savior, you can never have Jesus in your life. You have to admit you have a problem, it's sin. Now when you admit you have a problem, that's a big step, you have to admit it. B, you can believe that the only answer is Jesus, not your good works, not any other way. Watch how clear scripture is on this, Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given by which mankind can be saved. Zero. It's Jesus and that's it. By the way, that's a great gift God gave us that he even gave us his son. It's not unfair. That is incredibly gracious. Now, you might say, well, I do believe. I believe in Jesus. I'm good, right? This is where so many people stop. They stop at belief. And I just want you to, I wanna read you a passage of scripture so you can understand that belief in Jesus is not enough. James chapter two, verse 19 says, do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but observe you complacently sitting back as if you've done something wonderful? Well, that's just great. Demons do that, but what good does that do them? In other words, do you understand even Satan and his demons believe in Jesus? They know he's real. What good does that do them? Nothing. You have to move beyond belief to putting your faith and trust in Jesus. What does that look like? It's C, that you would commit your life to Jesus by repenting and being baptized. Now here's what repentance is. Repentance is you walking along doing life your way and one day you decide to make a U-turn and do it God's way. That's what repentance is. And some of you have not repented. You've, you've said like, no, nah, I'm gonna do life my way. No, nope. you need to orient your life to God. And when you make the decision to repent, you're baptized. And baptism is simply you representing with your life what Jesus did for you. You go underneath the water, which represents his death. And when you come out of the water, it represents his resurrection. And guess what? You become a brand new person. And here's the greatest news to me. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What happened in scripture was every single time, if you read through the New Testament, every single time someone decided to commit their life to Jesus, watch what happened. Peter, the very first time, very first message ever preached about Jesus after Jesus rose from the grave, watch what Peter says to people that were cut to the heart and said, I, want, I need Jesus, what should I do, Peter? Here's what Peter said. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And watch this, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just Jesus coming to live in your life and take up residence in your heart. Which means that emptiness you feel, you know that hole you feel at night? You've been trying to fill it with alcohol and drugs and more sex and another relationship and you still walk away empty all the time? God's Spirit fills you to where you now have hope and peace for the first time. And by the way, all those issues you've been trying to deal with on your own, now you have the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that exists inside of you to help you live the life you've always wanted. And so many people think, whoa, Jesus came to make bad people good. Wrong. Jesus came to make dead people a 
lie. And I want you to see the rest of the story of three people you heard earlier who repented and were baptized and their life was transformed. Watch this. I had a relationship with God. I knew he was this guy up in heaven who was watching me, um, but it was more or less just telling me whether or not I was worthy of going to heaven. I just remember sitting in my room one day just feeling so broken and asking God, why is it that I'm doing everything right in the world's eyes, I'm pursuing you know, fitness, I'm working hard, I'm striving for all of these things, and I'm still feeling so broken and so empty. And I'm like, God, just change my heart, or show me another way, I just need to know another way. And he did, he brought me to CCV, and um, ever since then it's been, my life has just been changed for good. I've learned that I don't have to strive to be good enough. Um, I learned, you know, that I can rest in who God says I am. Um, he says I'm loved. He says I'm worthy. Um, and I've learned that what matters is what God says about me and how much I love other people and how I serve him. As Jesus taught us in the Bible, he said, love the Lord with all your heart soul and mind and i did it backwards uh, you know mind came first perhaps that's why it took me years to really come back to faith the idea that science and faith are at odds i've come to see that that is totally false and the science is our ability as human beings using the minds that he's given us to understand his creation and it, it's not to undermine our belief in God. It actually reinforces it, because if you look at the wonders of any part of God's creation, it just gives you great confidence that someone much, much greater than us is uh, responsible for the beauty that we see. I was in the county jail and went to a church service just to get out of my cell. And uh, the guy that was doing the message was talking about uh, giants in your life. And I said, what about the giant of me, man? He just looked at me and said, that's perfect. You put that there. And it just threw me off, and I didn't know what to say. Uh, and I sat there, listened to him preach, and he started reading out the Bible. Uh, and it was like information I had been looking for my whole life. And I was like, what was that? I want to hear more of this. I, I went back to my pot and, and uh, ended up giving my life to Jesus June 28, 2007 in the county jail, because I was just thinking, no, it's, it couldn't be as simple as Jesus. Uh, and it, it actually was as simple as Jesus. All I did was say yes to the Lord. Uh, and when I said yes to the Lord, my whole life has never been the same again. I, I'm, I'm a pastor and I go back into the jails and prisons and do ministry now. I've just now surrendered my whole life to, to the Lord. I know that everything in my life has nothing to do with me. I know every bit of it has to do with the Lord and I give him the glory for every, all of it. Man, stories like that never get old. My favorite line is from Tracy at the end. He said, couldn't be as simple as Jesus. It was. It is. There's someone here today. The simplicity of the message of Jesus, what he's done for you, you've never accepted that free gift. You've had your excuses. I got my messes. I'll clean up first. Too many issues, too many doubts. No. Jesus is calling you today to accept that free gift so you can finally have the life you've always wanted. Your marriage needs it. Your peace needs it. Everything in your life hinges on what you do with Jesus. And I'm just gonna challenge someone here today. There's hundreds of you across our campuses. You've never done those things. You've never done A, B, C. You've never admitted you have a problem. You never truly believed. And this is the big one. You've never repented and been baptized. And I'm gonna challenge you today to make, to do, to make that step. 
And so many people are like, but I didn't come prepared to do that. Do you know we're always prepared for you? Come on. At, at the baptistry, at every campus, after every service, you go to our baptistry, we have a change of clothes. We have shorts in all sizes, shirts in all sizes. We have a towel. The shirt, you know what it says? Changed. Because that's what happens. That's what happened. So after the service, I'm going to challenge you to make a beeline to the baptistry and give your life to Jesus fully. Now we're going to sing one last song, and I just want to give you some space to make that decision. And if God's calling you today, you just be obedient. Just be obedient. And I want to talk to one group of people here today, and that is a group of people that you, you were baptized as an infant. I'm going to challenge you to make the decision as an adult. And here's why. Every example in Scripture of baptism is of someone at an age where they knew what they were doing. Even Jesus was baptized at the age of 30 as our example. You might say, well, can I be baptized twice? Do you know I was baptized twice? I don't know if I've ever told the story. I was baptized as a really little child. I had no idea what I was doing. I only did it because I watched my brother get in the water. That's it. Later on I realized that wasn't my decision. There was no transformation. So I made the decision for myself and I got baptized, and I'm telling you, I stand before you as a transformed man. I want that for you. Jesus is calling someone here. And heaven is about ready to get a whole lot louder as you join in with Jesus. Amen? Let's sing this together. Chasing a feeling, a place of belonging, a place we can let go of all of the shame we borrow. And all of this searching has brought us to one thing. Come on, we sing Jesus. His world to our dreaming. Our God dream is better than scheming. So rich is the status we're leaving. This world's got nothing I'm needing. Cause the maker who came up with breathing is bringing us into his kingdom.
if, if stay standing for just a minute. If, if you're already a follower of Jesus, you should not walk away with just like crazy inspiration for the power of the gospel, the simple gospel. But here's what I know. There's someone here today and Jesus is calling you to give your life to him and get baptized today, not tomorrow, today. Do not put off until tomorrow what you have the ability of accepting the free gift today. So here's my prayer. Uh, when I get done praying, you do not walk to your car, you walk to the water. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the simple yet life-changing message of the gospel, that Jesus came to die for us and rise again so we could have hope for today, peace every day going forward. I pray for those that need to accept Jesus that today they would make that decision and go all in, never looking back. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter, CCB. Go out and have a great one.